Well, it's often called the holy grail of energy, promising cheap, abundant, and clean energy for the planet, fusion power. It's the same thing that powers the sun and the stars. Well, we followed those in search of that holy grail in this Energy Next. And we're out of gas. Yeah, it's no big deal. We got Mr. Fusion, right? For Back to the Future fans, I need fuel. Fusion is what powered the DeLorean. For scientists and engineers in the real world, it's an elusive form of energy they've worked for decades trying to perfect. From Stan Mylora, who runs the Fusion Energy Division at Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. You can have an inexhaustible source of energy. To Mark Supis, a so-called amateur fusionist who built his own mini lab in New York City. This is just right there. It might just be right there. It might not be, but it might be so close. By day, Supis is a web designer for fashion giant Gucci in Manhattan. Okay, so this is ready to go. And By night, is, like, he's busy at his lab, pressure. working so on what many think is the ultimate energy the source. Is to, in its most basic form, fusion occurs when the nuclei of two hydrogen atoms are forced together and fuse to form a helium atom. When they fuse, they release energy. It's what has Supis and about three dozen other amateur fusionists nationwide building tabletop devices at home. I've always been really fascinated with uh, physics and chemistry and, you know, all the hard sciences, and I am self-educated. Fusion first caught Supa's attention when he saw a Google video featuring the late fusion scientist Dr. Robert Bussard. This video that Dr. Bussard gave, um, Should Google Go Nuclear? And I was really taken with it because it seemed like the first kind of innovation in the fusion space in a really long time. That was enough to get him to sink $40,000 of his own savings into this lab and equipment. I bought this whole thing on eBay. About seven months later, Supas claims he achieved fusion. There it is. And the positive ions are all rushing into the center and colliding head on. And so that's what gives you the, you know, when they do it enough times, you get the fusion. What excites you the most about the potential for this, for fusion energy? I mean, this is so exciting on so many levels. Like, how is it not exciting? This is like, if you do this, it's, it changes everything forever, and it solves the energy problem. It solves the energy problem. But can tabletop experiments like this really overcome the massive barriers to fusion encountered so far? Namely, to produce not one fusion reaction, or even a few million per second some experiments have, but billions and billions in a controlled reaction that's self-sustaining, producing more energy than goes in, and keeps doing that predictably for months or years at a time. That's what brought us to Tennessee's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where some of the nation's top fusion scientists and engineers have been studying fusion energy for decades. It's simple in principle, but it's very hard to achieve in practice. Stan Mylora knows how hard fusion is to achieve. He started in this field 36 years ago. You have to have essentially astronomical temperatures to make this reaction to proceed uh, very rapidly. So we're talking about temperatures that are 10 times higher than the temperature of the core of the sun. That's upwards of 150 million degrees to make fusion work on Earth, also called a star in a jar. So that's the real challenge, is how do you heat it to those astronomical temperatures, and then how do you confine it, keep it from getting out of the, out of the bottle, essentially. The challenge is alluring enough that it brought together seven of the world's leading powers to agree to a joint nuclear facility, the culmination of 20 years of negotiation on a massive experimental reactor. Construction started this year in the south of France. It's called ITER for International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. Ned Sautoff of Oak Ridge National Lab took me inside the fusion process. You and I are going to be shadows, and the plasma is going to be bright. <laughs> With a massive screen that felt more like I was in an IMAX movie than a fusion lab. So you can imagine you're now the plasma, and you're approaching a, a, an antenna, which is launching about 20 million watts of power, just like comes out of a television station, but 10,000 times as much. And so these waves go and heat the plasma. When the plasma gets hot enough, then the parts of the plasma start hitting each other, sticking together, fusing, and then release energy. Our game here is to get ITER just big enough that it becomes nearly self-sustaining. 
Here's a look at fusion research in the real world. This is the NSTX fusion device here at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab in New Jersey. This is a $200 million facility where scientists deal with temperatures up to 50 million degrees and experiments that will ultimately produce fusion energy. Stuart Prager at the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab says fusion is near a breakthrough and could be a game changer for the global energy picture. Fusion could have a transformative effect on, uh, on the world uh, because it's limitless source of energy. Uh, it has a zero contribution to greenhouse gases. It's entirely clean. It's safe. There's no chance of any sort of runaway reaction. And the fuel comes from seawater, so it's available to all nations. So hopefully it will reduce the conflict over natural resources. So it's nearly a perfect uh, energy source. Critics argue against the billions spent and yet to be spent on fusion research, saying energy sources like wind, solar, and geothermal are far more achievable on commercial scale far sooner. Your wind can trigger for a slow close. Still, my Laura and other believers say the Eater facility in France is worth the expense because it will lead to the final goal. It's the penultimate step to a demonstration fusion reactor where you'll actually deliver uh, electricity and then eventually that would grow into commercial fusion reactors. My Laura sees a day when fusion energy provides about 30% of the world's energy. So you're pretty confident that in our lifetime we will see this as a source of energy that can be sustained? Yes, sure. I think about 2050 we should be introduced fusion at, be able to introduce fusion on a commercial scale, but about 2035 we should start building demonstration fusion reactors. So you'll see electricity being demonstrated at about 2035. Meanwhile, back in Brooklyn, Mark Supis keeps tinkering, trying to be the one who does it. So right now For now, still holding on to his day job at Gucci. You want to change the world? Absolutely. And you think you can? I mean, I'm going to try, you know? It's like, who knows what's possible? But, uh, you know, you got to try. Well, sitting with Supis, you can really feel the enthusiasm that he has for his work. Talking with him, he is genuine. Right now, he's trying to raise $200 million so he can take this on as a full-time job and build a full-size break-even reactor. Not sure how his neighbors in New York City or how Gucci is going to feel about that.